Eh, con Masen Najawi, que yo le había, usted acá lo tiene, eh, más o menos para presentarlo de una forma, eh, de una forma fácil, es un gurú eh, de las redes sociales. ¿Qué significa esto? Es un hombre que eh, se dedica, en este caso concreto, a monitorear eh, lo, lo que pasa en las redes sociales con una empresa que se llama Socialize, y que eh, bueno, anticipó un montón de, de, de movimientos políticos en el Medio Oriente y vino a la Argentina a eh, traer el sistema, que no es solamente un software, sino que es, que es un, un sistema de monitoreo de lo que más preocupa hoy a los políticos y a las empresas, que es qué se está diciendo de ellos en las redes sociales. Masen, thank you very much for coming to La Hora de Maquiavelo. And I, I, I was lucky to be able to hear your presentation in Buenos Aires um, and uh, I was uh, surprised uh, how you could anticipate the, well, the revolution in Egypt and the uh, uprisings in, in the whole Arab world through the social media. Well, I think uh, I always like to use the term we cannot Google the future. But what we can do is look at social media and all other media and track it efficiently in order to find out what kind of trend data we can compile and what kind of information we can learn. Therefore, before the Egyptian revolution, by tracking Egyptian social media on political issues and so on, we found very good evidence and clear trends of people becoming far more anti-governmental and far more revolutionary in their conversation. Therefore, we did not predict that the Egyptian revolution would happen, but we had clear indicators that major political change was in fact about to happen. And uh, do you think this uh, way of analyzing the social media, the uh, uh, social networks, would be useful in, in Latin America, for example, or in countries like Argentina, to anticipate, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, election outcomes? Absolutely, there's no question about it. I believe that social media has become a great democratizing tool. It is the kind of tool and process that allows everybody to become part of the political, national discourse of communication, of being able to talk about politics, society, personal issues. And by being able to listen to people on social media, we can do in Latin America what we did in the Middle East. But isn't it maybe, I don't know, if cheaper or isn't it use more useful to do what normally uh, pollsters do, to just to, to check public opinion? Well, we don't say that polling is bad or that it should end. I believe that polling and social media will start to have to work together and that you're going to need a lot more best practice on how to poll people, people who are in fact online. Having said that, polling is a lot more time consuming, lengthy, and perhaps more expensive than taking the opinion of people who are in fact on social media. Social media, you have access to millions of people who are talking genuinely without any filter about what they think, what they believe, and what they are going to do. Whereas polling, you always have questions which might not be properly done, mm. or you might have people who might not answer properly mm. or genuinely. There are a lot of challenges related to polling. Social media can help do what polling does, but far more efficiently. Having said that, social media opinion data also has pitfalls and problems, because not everyone wants to communicate necessarily on what they believe too openly. They could be very selective about where they are talking and who they are talking about. So in each practice, traditional polling or social media opinion data, there are advantages and disadvantages. And they will have to learn to work together. But how about countries like we see that in Argentina, uh, that hire lots of people to talk uh, nice about the government, or to insult the opposition. <laughs> is then a possibility to filter those, um, let's say, those fake uh, social media people 
uh, and to discriminate the real opinion of the, uh, of, of the masses? Well, uh, what you're talking about we refer to as masked engagement. When a group of people are working on behalf of a company or a government to pretend that they are members of the public, uh, but in reality they are working for that government or for a company. Uh, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And sooner or later people will figure out who these people are and it will create great embarrassment to the governmental entity or the corporate entity that might be pushing that kind of activity. Can you filter it out? Most of the time you can. For example today, when you look at the revolution in Syria, which is unfortunately a very bloody and violent revolution, and you go and you look at articles about Syria in uh, the Arab internet, you will often find up to 80 or 90 percent of the comments on that article all positive about the government of Syria. Now let's face it, there might be a few people in the world who do support the government of Syria but they are not 80 or 90 percent. If they were 80 or 90 percent we would not be having a revolution. And President Assad of Syria five days ago in his speech uh, to the country praised the electronic army for the work that they were doing in protecting the government. I do not believe that that will work. We will be able to identify who these people are. We can show people what is unusual. There's a lot of copy-pasting going on when they're using their mask engagement. They often come across as being not personal, very formal in the way that they write. And frequently you'll find that they have a particular style of writing and communicating which is quite structured and organized, which is very opposite to social media, which is very chaotic, disorganized, and very personal. You can feel it from the heart, if you will. But mass engagement comes across as being too structured, and sooner or later it will be found, and it will be uh, something that will backfire on the people who are organizing it. Mm -hmm. Well, and being the social media so personal and uh, it's so complicated, it's so complicated to distinguish um, if people are not using sarcasm or irony, and uh, it's so different from the normal uh, journalistic language, the, the the media language. Right. How can you exactly know what? are people talking about in social media, especially when I compare what I myself uh, write on Twitter, because I use a lot of sarcasm and I may be saying that <laughs> Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, our president, is marvelous. And mm -hmm. I know my followers know I'm saying exactly the contrary, yeah. but how can you distinguish it? Well, uh, social media research should not always be automated. And we believe that any kind of social media research depends on three things. Number one, automation technology. The ability to go and capture millions of conversations and cut them down into a few thousand. Part two would be to use very good dictionary and language data to identify how words are being used and in what context, whether they're in irony or sarcasm, etc. But finally, part three would be about methodology. Being able to have a very good, robust methodology of research that will allow a human analyst to be able to study who is the author. They will ask, well, who are you? What is your background? Are you in favor of the government or in favor of the president or not? They will do their full research as to who the author or the influencer actually will be. And they will have trend data from the past and from current data to find out what the contextual use of language actually is. So a machine or machine technology or automated technology sometimes can capture irony and sarcasm, but not all the time. Mm. And the accuracy is between 40 and 45 percent if you are talking about a Latin script language like English or Spanish. If you try to use automation technology for Arabic or Farsi, it might go down to 30% because we have hundreds of dialects and so on. Therefore, the need for a human analyst is extremely important. It's extremely critical. I've always said that when it comes to social media analysis, there is no silver bullet. 
social media analysis is not a tool, it is a service, it is a methodology, it's a way of thinking and researching. Mm. Um, and you were, you were talking about um, the new trend in the Arab world that uh, people are demanding more uh, nationalism and uh, more intervention from the government. And um, you said that after these revolutions, uh, the future that you are now seeing through social media is not so bright for the Arab world. I am very concerned. I see a large number of young people in Egypt and other countries demanding freedom and liberty. They are calling for all of the right things, freedom, democracy, justice, but the evidence will show from social media that they are calling for a much greater role of government in their private and their public life. They want more jobs in government. They want higher salaries from government. They want more subsidies from government. They want mm. more companies from government. They want more hospitals and schools from government. Well, what about the private sector? What about individualism? If the government is going to re-establish control the way they had done over the past 50 years, but in a different way and with a different leader, then the revolution has failed. Ultimately, without individualism, the individual human being has no sovereignty over his own life. The greater the government, the less the sovereignty over an individual uh, that the individual has over himself or herself. And what worries me the most is that dichotomy. When you have a young population emerging from a national trauma, a traumatic period in the national consciousness, mm. They're calling for nationalism. They're proud about their country. They're proud that they overthrew the previous regime. But they're calling for much greater government. And I concern myself with the fact that you look through history. When's the last time you heard of a country that emerged from trauma, had a young population, nationalistic and proud, but calling for centralized authority, which happened to have extreme ideology in the background? And to me, there is a parallel with 1930s Germany. And I'm concerned mm. that the calls for national socialism in Egypt and other parts of the Middle East may take us to a place where we don't want to go. And if you can add that there is one enemy in common, the Jewish people. So you well, have the perfect uh, mix for a nationalist surge in the Middle East. I think you'll find that the whole issue of Palestine-Israel or the Arab-Israeli conflict is one which is becoming increasingly irrelevant. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you'll find that as people need to struggle to survive in Egypt, in Jordan, in Syria, the people who are fighting for their life today in Syria don't care about the Arab-Israeli political problem. They care about being alive. They care about being able to overthrow their government, to be able to live and move into the future comfortably and have a bright uh, opportunity for their children. So that's a big part of the reason why the Arab-Israeli conflict for quite a, 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 quite a bit of time now, at least 15 years, has not been on the top of the agenda of the region anymore because people have much more important things to worry about. That's number one. Number two, the political consciousness of the region has accepted that Israel will become part of the region forever. Until the 1960s, the 1970s, people thought, oh, we hope we can get rid of Israel. But now you have a younger generation, which is much better educated. They were born and Israel already existed. So it's unlike their fathers and their grandfathers who grew up and there was no Israel in the 1930s. Um, so I would disagree. I do not think that the Arab people in general are unified in anger or hatred against a common enemy. If they do have a con common em enemy, it is a struggle for daily survival. Food, petrol prices, jobs, education, health care. That's the common challenge. Um, but things like social media have been very important, not only in driving the revolution in the Arab world, but in 
influencing the idea of who are we as a people and who are our enemies as well. And I think in the old days where you had central authority, strong military governors, Saddam Hussein, Hafez al-Assad, Hosni Mubarak, they defined who we were and they defined who our enemies were. Today we the people define who we are mm. and we the people define who our enemies are. And you know what? The Arab people are looking to the north in Europe, they're looking to the west in America, they're looking to the east in Asia. And generally, they see no enemies because America has been our best friend and ally mm. for more than 50 years. Europe is our historical uh, trading and cultural partner. Asia has never tried to uh, occupy us or attack us. And with a country like Israel, you have this consciousness of growing recognition of the fact that the Jewish people have a right to be in the Holy Land. And unlike the 1920s when our grandparents said, oh, they have no right to be here, why are they coming from Europe? Today people recognize actually they have a right to be here. Under our education system, we did not read about the fact that there were Jews there 5,000 years ago. We were only told, oh, they came from Russia, they came from Poland, Ethiopia. Uh, but the reality is becoming clear, thanks to social media, th thanks to things like wiki information. People can learn about the truth. And uh, I think you are at a stage in history where the Arab people have accepted the presence of a state of Israel and will have no problem going forward. And every Arab government has said they are willing to recognize Israel. Uh, they just need to be able to find a political solution with the Palestinians. And my last question is, how can this dichotomy live together in the social media that uh, people want to be free, but they want the government to take care of everything? Right. Well, it won't work. It won't work. If we do go down that path, we will have a lot of trouble in the future. But what it does mean is we can use social media research to identify the dichotomy and to push back against it and to go to the new government in Egypt and say, look what's happening. There's a dichotomy here. You need to make the state smaller. Or to go to policymakers in Brussels and in Washington and say, we need to promote the values of individualism, of private entrepreneurship, of international trade. And we need to go to the education system in this new Middle East, in the post-revolution Middle East, and make sure that every minister of education has a clear brief as to what happened in Germany and Italy and Spain in the 1930s, so that we do not make that same mistake. We are heading down that road, but it's not too late. We have the opportunity to fight back against it and to use an education process through social media to ensure a brighter future for our children. Interesting, and I think uh, countries in Latin America, especially Argentina, are on that uh, a dangerous path as well. Mm. So thank you very much. Siga viendo la obra de Maquiavelo. <laughs>